Okay, um, so welcome back everyone. Welcome to the new participants. For those who don't know me, I'm Maureen. I created this series this year. I'm French, but from a tiny island, tiny French island, the Caribbean called Martinique. And I'm a medical entomologist. I earned my PhD in south of France, Marseille, and I'm now based in Kilifi, which is a small coastal town uh, in Kenya. So today I'm going to talk to you about an approach I've been developing these past six years uh, to identify arthropods. There are blood meals and also to detect uh, if they are carrying pathogens. So why would we want to identify arthropods? Well, I'm sure you know that some arthropods are able to transmit pathogens and which will provoke what we call vector-borne diseases. And it's important to you know if we're dealing with one of these arthropodal factors and one that is not. So you have to understand that vector transmission is a very active process. It's not a syringe that uh, a blood sucking bug taking infected blood, infected blood from you and injecting it uh, into someone else. There are very specific interactions happening between the pathogen and its vector, and uh, it results in quite big specificity of this couple. So uh, knowing this, you are able to extrapolate from the distribution of a vector if you could have this or this vector-borne disease in a particular area. Particular area. So this is what, what I mean when I say that they are an epidemiological tool. So how do you um, identify arthropods? There are, are several gold standard methods I will just list here. Um, and we'll talk about them later. So the gold standard is morphological identification. Of course, you just look at it. You use morphological document keys uh, to guide you and uh, narrow it down to a species. Molecular biology is based on the DNA of your insect. And these two methods present um, quite a few limits. That's why in the last years, some new methods has, have been are emerging, such as Maldit of MS, which is the one I'm going to talk about today. So let's start with morphological identification. So you just look at some specific criteria on your arthropod, and depending if they are present or absent or their shape, you're able to narrow it down to a species using uh, what we call morphological keys. So this is a very, very, very simplified key for tick identification. So you see that we start, for example, with the position of the anal groove. And um, it, if it's in front, then it's an exodus. If it's not, it's something else. Uh, and then you go down like, like this, um, changing character, looking, for example, here at the rostrum, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry. And um, you narrow it down to one species here. Uh, it's stop at the genus level because it's just a simplified key. But uh, if you have a proper morphological key, the one that we use, it goes down all the way to the species. So it seems very simple. Right? You just have to look at it. But then this, so these are four different bugs. So these are two different triatomines. And I hope you can see my mouse because I, I'm saying here, here, here. But uh, so the bug on the right are two different triatomines and on the left you have two different bad bugs. So don't pay attention to the color, they are exactly the same color. And um, you can easily see here that if you have no um, entomologic background, it's very difficult for you to know what to look at to differentiate all these four insects. Um, and also, even if you have entomological training, you can imagine that if you have 500 of these, at some point you get tired and you might make some mistakes. Then molecular biology, if you don't know at all what it is, very briefly, you have your original sample, which here is an insect, uh, from which you will extract uh, its DNA. Then you will target and amplify one specific gene, uh, gene because uh, you know that the sequence of this gene might help you identify your insect. Going all the way down here, you obtain his sequence, you know, ATCGG, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and when you have this sequence, you will do what we call a blast, meaning you are going to compare your sequence to a database of reference sequences. And then, or after this comparison, you will be able to tell if your sequence is perfectly identical to another, another species, meaning that it's the same thing, or closely related. But this um, has 
quite a few limitations. First, it's very much easier if you're rich because sequencing is definitely not cheap. And also you are um, dependent of that last database. Um, so of course, when you submit it to the shared database, there is some kind of control on buying CBI. They mostly check the format, but basically if I was submitting a sequence of myself and was signing the title that was a sequence of a rat, it might go there. So um, you have to be um, aware that these sequences issues happen. So um, Mild FMS is one of the approaches that has emerged in the last decades so, um, for orthopod identification, but it's been around a long while. It's been traditionally used for the identification of large biomolecules such as DNA, RNA and proteins. And since the 90s, it's really um, routinely used in uh, clinical uh, laboratories because it's because of the, the easy, um, sorry, <coughs> because how easy it is to um, identify bacteria, fungi, and sometimes viruses with it. So it's based on a comparison of protein profile. You are generating your uh, protein profile from your unknown sample that you compare to a database of known protein profiles. Uh, and it's very cheap because the regions to extract the protein and to submit it to Malditov are very, very cheap, and it's very simple to use and quite quick. So Malditov stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. It's a mouthful, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, matrix Assisted, because your matrix, is, your sample is co-crystallized with the matrix, and you will hit all of it with a laser, which will cause desorption and then ionization of your sample. So all these peptides are going to fly um, through what we call a time of flight tube. Um, so there is basically vacuum in that tube, which means that your samples are going to fly according to their mass. So the very tiny protein, they are going to fly super quickly and hit the detector, uh, while the bigger one are going to fly slower and hit it later. And what happened when they hit the detector is that each time one protein hit it, you have a peak. Okay? Uh, so the result, you have what we call a spectrum, which is the combination of all the peaks. And because it is specific of the protein content of your sample, you can just say that it's specific of your sample. Okay. So this is what we uh, have started using for article identification. So you have a, a workflow that is always the same. First of all, you need high quality spectrum. So there are a couple of things that can alter the quality of your spectrum. First are the quality itself of the sample to start with. Um, if uh, your sample is very, very dry, or if it was preserving vodka instead of, of ethanol 70%, um, this is going to impact your spectrum. And also the protocol. So it's not magical. It's not just extracting protein harder and then trying to submit it in multiple. For each sample, you have to find a correct protocol, which is meaning the correct body part to use, and then how to crush it in what. And then um, after all this adjustment, you choose which protocol is on the proper one. Once you have all your high quality spectra, you need to check within species reproducibility and interspecies specificity. Uh, it's actually very simple. It means that two uh, identical arthropods should have identical spectra and two different arthropods should have different spectra. Okay. So um, these are all prerequisites to uh, multisoft analysis. And then you can go Bit further and start your database, which is only composed of formally identified samples only. So if you are a morphology expert and you think that your morphological identification is reliable, you can base your database on that. Otherwise, we mostly use molecular biology. And then you need to validate your protocol and your database. So we, you do what we call a blind test. So you submit the rest of your samples to the database for a query. And you have two outcomes, of course. One, um, your sample is correctly identified, which means that um, the sample that you queried had a counterpart in the database, but also that the protocol that you designed was uh, appropriate. If um, and the, you can also have samples that are not uh, properly identified, so we give you completely different species, or correctly identified but with a very low score, it would mean either that you have compared two different things, that the, the query is not present in the database, so you can't have a match, or because the protocol you designed doesn't allow you to um, identify this kind of sample. 
So I, I, we started on ticks and I, my tick friends here I might recognize on the top Ripicephalus sanguinis, which is the brand of tick, Dermacentum marginalis, and Amblyomma variegatum. So we started on Amblyomma variegatum because of its size, and we decided to take the legs. Why the legs? Because um, we didn't want to be anywhere near blood, because first of hemoglobin is a very large protein, so basically it ruins your spectrum, and also because we want to focus on, on the insect itself, in this case, alphabet itself, uh, you don't want to be contaminated by host proteins. You don't want there to be contaminated by the, the blood of whoever she bit, bit before. So based on the legs, we created spectra from Exodus resinus, uh, which is the vector of uh, Borla bedefferi, uh, Lyme disease, and Amblyomma variegatum. What you can see here, we have four specimens of Exodus resinus, and they have quite identical spectra. Same for Ambium variegatum, four specimen, four um, identical spectra. So here we check the within species uh, reproducibility box. What is interesting is that those spectra from um, exogenous are different from the spectra of um, Ambium variegatum. So we also check um, interspecies specificity. So we kept working on ticks. So this is Adama, and he came back from Mali with so many different uh, tick species. And you can see on the dendrogram that each species is on a specific cluster. So how do you read that? I'm just going to explain to you because I'm going to present a few our dendrograms later. So the longer the branch, the most different the sample are. Okay? So when you have little rope cluster like this, it means that your samples, your spectra are very similar. So here, for example, you can see that all the emblem of variegated spectra, they're very similar. All the uh, um, yellow mare FPS were uh, very similar, but they were different from one another. Okay. So we also did that with uh, another student called Mede. He came from Algeria with 10,000 ticks and did nice uh, morphological identification, identification work. We were able to create spectra, very neat spectra for uh, each of them. And here again, a dendrogram, you can see that each species is on the different branch. So it's quite clean. So this is something I did a few years ago. So these are triatomines, so I them a bit earlier. And uh, what I didn't tell you is that they are quite famous for transmitting a parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi that infects humans uh, in South America and Central America mostly. And um, in triatomines, you have what we call species complex. So you have species that are very, very, very morphologically similar but end up having a very different roles in the transmission of trypanosoma crazy in this case. Um, for example, the rodnus complex, you have rodnus prolixus, that is one of the major vectors of trypanosoma crazy, and rodnus robustus, that is the one that looks exactly like it, but don't really transmit it that much. So it's important to be able to tell which one you're dealing with. So if you remember the workflow I've presented you before, you know that first you need to check for high quality spectra, to generate them and check for them. So um, Generating quality spectra, you have to choose the proper body part. Uh, for us, at the end, it ended up being the, the femur of the median leg. And our, we designed also the crushing program to extract the proteins, which give us all this quite nice spectra. Uh, and after the visual in, um, inspection of the quality of the spectra, we constructed a database and we validated our database with a blind test. So this is our um, results. Again, you can see that species are clustered together and we were also able to differentiate the developmental stage. What is interesting is that this is the couple I was telling you about earlier, Regis polexus, Regis robustus, and um, Maldisov doesn't have any issues differentiating the two of them. So it was, um, it was quite cool. We kept going. Uh, so we decided to work on mosquitoes and because it was doing working so well with legs, we stayed with legs and, um, and it worked. So we're quite happy. Um, you can see here that we had very nice spectra for all the species that were submitted and we confirmed that with a gel view. Um, so all, as well, I'm going to present a few gel views later. So I'm just going to explain to you how it works. Uh, it works. So you have here spectrum one with hits five peaks and you compare it to spectra two and three. And what you can see is that if the second peak, for example, is conserved throughout all your specimen, then you will have a straight line throughout your gel view. Otherwise, if they are uh, completely heterogeneous, you will have like stairs like this. So you can use it for um, 
two different applications. You can use it to show if a big number of spectra are very reproducible, then you will have straight line everywhere. Or on the contrary, as it is the case here, um, to check if they are all different. So we kept working on mosquitoes too. This is Andrea. She came from Sydney with so many gorgeous mosquitoes. And their need for a database comes from the fact that they have incursions of foreign mosquitoes through their port all the time. And they also have local species that are able to transmit um, pathogens responsible for malaria or dengue. So they were in need of a tool that was uh, reliable and quick and affordable to identify um, mosquito species. So they collected all their mosquitoes in New South Wales and in there a team performed uh, molecular analysis. So they use the COI gene, which is a very common gene for alpha identification, including mosquitoes. And here you can see, uh, yeah, here, that the COI was unable to differentiate between Culex molestus and Culex concretus. Um, of course, if you're particularly interested in these, you can target another gene and find a way to differentiate them, but that would be another step. But using Molotov, we treated all the samples the same way, and you can see that Molotov has no issues differentiating Kilex and Fashionis here and uh, PPS molestus here. So we were quite happy about that. We also work on fleas. So this is Antonio that came from Sevilla with um, several fleas from Algeria, uh, from uh, Sevilla and uh, Russia that is here today, we, who brought fleas, uh, fleas from Algeria. So we knew that fleas were be able to be identified using Molotov MS because um, it had been previously developed using manual pestles, so you just print them. And, uh, but now we are not using manual pestle anymore we, because of the heterogeneous results you get. So we are doing automated crushing. And um, because his fleas were all in alcohol, we had to uh, apply a dealkalization process and try to identify them. We finally managed to find a nice protocol that generated fairly nice spectra. And what was really exciting was the result of um, dendrogram, because you know dendrogram are totally different from phylogenetic tree. So usually you have a very different organization uh, of your dendrogram compared to phylogeny. Uh, what, but it's not the point. You don't, we're not doing phylogeny. So we're just trying to look at uh, if the cluster are homogeneous, if you have one species per cluster only, and then like the, all the others separated. But here we're super happy because they were classified per species, but per family as well. And, um, and what's, what's even um, better is that we managed to differentiate very easily Clenocephalus phallus from Clenocephalus canis. And if you have ever had to work on molecular identification of fleas, you know that differentiating those two can be tricky. You need a very specific portion of very specific genes, or it's not the easiest. Uh, so we're very happy about that. I've also worked with Basma uh, on the identification of um, lice that she had collected from animals in Algeria. And you can see that although some of them are very characteristic, some of them kind of look alike. And you have to remember these, this is, these are lice, so they are small. And the second issue is that is the supporting document don't really exist or you have very few of them. So instead of just Googling it, you have to find this very specific book. It's not uh, the easiest thing. Um, so she did great work identifying all these morphologically. We thought that we could use molecular biology to help us, but it's worse. It, it, like, it's the nightmare of GenBank. You had what, sequence that were not available, sequence that, was, that were there, but that, they were just, outrageously bad, it was just a nightmare. But finally, we managed to create our database for all her uh, uh, life species. Uh, you can't really read it here, but each color is a species, so you can see that they are properly distinguished. So there are a few of the insects that were identified using multiple of MS. Um, I was not always uh, including these work, but for example, here, uh, they managed to identify Calicoides, which are very, very tiny uh, insects, so quite uh, challenging to do the morphological identification, and sand flies. Uh, sand flies, same thing, they are tiny, they are fragile, you really identifying them morphologically, you just want to cry. Um, so we're quite happy to be able to create a database. So at, at that point, 
I won't say that you get bored, but you get excited. Um, what else you could uh, try to see using Malditov? So in my case, I tried to see if Malditov was able to detect plasmodium in mosquitoes directly. So plasmodium, for those who don't know, is the parasite that causes malaria, and it's transmitted by mosquitoes of the genus Anopheles. So of course, this is something that is done every day. So there are other methods. Um, but they all have limits again. So if you are to identify your mosquito, you will mostly use uh, molecular biology, which is uh, limited by cost mostly. And um, for the detection of the parasite, you can either use uh, molecular biology again or uh, immunological methods such, such as ELISA. But even ELISA has, is great. But uh, if you are working on exotic species, you might be limited by the availability of antibodies or um, you also, you have to take into account the cross reactivity of antibodies from very similar species. And even if that's fine, if, if you want to do it this way, you will always have to do two steps, identify your mosquito and then identify your parasite. What I wanted to do is develop a tool that allows you in one step to, to identify your mosquito, tell if it's infected or not and by which parasite. Um, so for that, I had to infect mosquitoes and so just a brief reminder on the cycle of plasmodium. So a mosquito will inject you sporozoites. Those sporozoites will continue their cycle in your body, transforming into a gametocyte. And the gametocyte is the form that, that is able to infect another mosquito. Okay. Um, so to infect my mosquitoes, I had to infect mice uh, artificially with sporozoite, wait for um, the gametocyte to appear in their blood. And this was uh, very challenging um, because the window of appearance of those gametocytes in the model I was using was very, very, very short. So as soon, so you do blood smears to look at the cells. Here, this is the picture I've, uh, I've had it on the top. So these are uh, red blood cells with gametocytes in it. And as soon as you see them, you can be sure that they will be gone in a couple of hours. So basically you have to run, get the mosquitoes, uh, put the mouse to sleep and feed the mosquitoes. Um, yeah, this project was my nemesis. I cried so, so much, it was a long time ago. <laughs> so uh, then once you have your mosquitoes that are presumably um, infected, you have to um, generate your spectra. So we uh, generated spectra for, the, for all the mosquitoes and you have to classify them uh, according to their infection status. So I did Malditov and PCR on the thorax, and, um, and so I classified the spectra between non-infected mosquitoes and our infected mosquitoes. So what we see here, that uh, I superimposed the spectra, all the spectra of the infected mosquitoes and all the spectra of the uh, uninfected mosquitoes. And you can see that there are um, several characteristic peaks depending of the category. These translated in blind tests, basically the result is that uh, of 80 mosquitoes, uh, 79 were properly classified according to the infection status, which means that we have now a database that will tell you, okay, this is Anopheles gambia and it's infected by this or this. So in my case, it was Anopheles stephansii infected by a plasmodium bergei anca. So we kept going, that was kind of cool. And this is the work I've been doing with, well, that is done with Besma. Um, she used to work on fleas, and as you might know, fleas are responsible for the transmission of several uh, bacteria, um, such as Bartonella. Which they transmit a few Bartonella that are responsible for endocarditis, for example. And we wanted to know if we would be able to detect Bartonella directly in fleas. So we generated the spectra of um, the bacterium only. So it did that with two bacteria, Bartonella ancillae and Bartonella quintana, but I'm just going to show you the results on Bartonella ancillae. So she generated the spectra of the bacterium. She um, generated the spectra of a flea infected by the bacterium, a flea that had cleared the infection, means that it was a flea uh, to which we gave infected blood, but ended up clearing the infection, and a flea that was completely negative, never exposed to the bacteria. And what you can see here is that each category um, a very, very specific spectra again, and it's translated in blight tests. We're able to completely identify very specifically the, the, the fleas that were completely negative, never exposed to anything. The fleas that were exposed to Bartonella quintana, exposed to, Bar uh, to Bartonella ancillae, infected uh, by one of these. 
so it was it, it was nice as well so after that we decided that we might as well try uh, the identification of blood meals um because you know if you are doing a, a medical entomology study it's important for you to know on which kind of host uh your insect is feeding if you are um looking at it from a human public health uh issue of course uh the risk is not the same if you have a mosquito that bites mainly humans or a mosquito that is only interested in cows for example so it's a very important component of uh, medical ontology studies so what we did is that we fed our rearing mosquitoes different type of blood so we had a very energetic uh, veterinarian at the time that was able to give us all these kind of blood don't worry like, no animal was harmed in this process but um so we fed the mosquitoes all this kind of blood and um separately so we had several groups each group was fed uh, specific blood and then we processed the abdomen uh, using malditoff and uh, at first we're a bit stressed because the, the spectra from blood meals are really really similar but then we realized what well, after a lot of process, processing of data that actually each blood is really really specific so we have now a database that is composed of at least um 20 blood meals and i can just blind test mosquitoes abdomen and um, the way you just eat so because we like to suffer um we're thinking okay maldotov is able to identify us simple blood meals but in nature it's not always simple um what can happen is successive blood meals actually what happens generally is that the mosquitoes will take blood digest it completely and feed again uh sometime on something else so when we try to identify uh the blood meal um what happens if the mosquito had fed on five different things before and also mixed blood meals which means that the mosquito is feeding on you and then you chase it and it goes and finishes blood meal on your dog so you end up with mosquitoes with a mixed blood meal human and dog each a certain percentage so for both situations we're wondering how we would uh, be able to identify that using Maldotov so for successive blood meals we fed all our mosquitoes human blood and then we separate them in six cages and each cage uh, was fed on cow sheep goat dog chicken or rabbit and um after 12 hours we are processed the the abdomen using Maldotov for mixed blood meals um well we just we just mix the blood we mixed um human and sheep human and dog and again because we like to suffer human sheep and dog um so i'm not going to present um i, have, I don't have a res uh, result slides from this because it's mainly table and you would really disconnect as soon as, I, as soon as i put that table here so let me just tell you uh the what for, for successive blood meals you just basically identify the last blood meal there is no impact of further blood meals if it's last, last meal was human you just detect human blood for mixed blood meals is uh, a bit more complicated and interesting um so if you only have human blood in your database and you are querying a mosquito that has human and sheep by default it will tell you human but you have quite a lower score and we ended up having to create a specific database for mixed blood meal um so when we create created the samples um we try different concentration but for the database you just put a 50 50 and it will tell you okay that is human dog that is human sheep so it was quite nice and the same uh, we had to add our uh, human sheep and dog in the database what was really interesting is that we used three mosquito species two anopheles from the same complex which is anopheles gambia gil and anopheles um, gambia colossi and uh, we also used aedes albopictus so if you have a database for blood meals that is are created with anopheles gambia gil mosquitoes uh, you can kind of identify the blood meals of an anopheles gambia colossi uh but if you try on the same with the same database to identify the blood meal of a of an aedes uh, uh not working so um, we, we had we were hoping at first very naively we're thinking that okay it's mostly blood proteins so maybe 
um, we could only have to create a blood database and it would be uh, enough to identify all mosquito species. But uh, it didn't work like that. It seems that it is really a mix of host proteins and, uh, and uh, blood, um, I mean, mosquito proteins and blood proteins. So we uh, actually have to do a few, um, a few databases, not really necessarily for all species, but definitely a few. Now, here I'm going to present you a few uh, recent results. So I'm not going to give too much detail because um, too many details because it is ongoing and it's um, unpublished yet. So we also managed to determine the age of mosquitoes. So uh, I think that every non-entomologist will like, how bored are you? So we can just wonder about the age of mosquitoes. But it's actually quite important because if you are doing vector control and you are killing mosquitoes, at some point the age structure of your population is going to be younger and younger. And even if you don't eradicate all your mosquitoes, you will have a younger population, which is quite important if you're talking about malaria because uh, the parasite takes 14, 10 to 14 days to reach the salivary glands. So if you only have young mosquitoes, even if they are infected, um, the parasite will not have the time to be mature enough to be able to be transmitted. So it's actually quite uh, an important feature. So right now, if you want to define the age of a mosquito, and also like its physiological age, you know, as, as she laid eggs and everything, um, it's quite tedious. You have to dissect the ovaries, detangle them, and look like they, sometimes they make little nods. And uh, depending on the presence, the number, the absence of nods, you can say, or that this female is newly paris, meaning that she has never laid eggs, or paris, and you can also tell how many times she has laid eggs, okay? Uh, so yeah, it's not something you want to do all the time. So we um, try to do that using Malditov. Uh, what you can see, but it's quite hard, so I'll put R for you, uh, is that there are these two bands, one here and one very faint here, that are present in the group Paris and not in the uh, newly Paris group. Um, and this translated very um, bluntly in the PCA. So this is a principal component analysis. Uh, we don't need to go uh, into detail because it is quite uh, intuitive. If the spots are close to one another, it means that the spectra are similar. Um, so here you can see that we have all our Paris here and all our newly Paris here and the two are different. So um, yeah, so this was our something quite exciting. And we, it's still ongoing and um, yeah, so just wait for the paper. Then um, we did with Fatou here, uh, some work on the identification of different strains of mosquitoes from French Polynesia. So this was very interesting because um, if you didn't know, some mosquitoes, mosquito populations in French Polynesia originated from one island and then the mosquitoes were disseminated uh, into the neighboring highlands. So uh, we were wondering if we were going to be able to differentiate the same mosquito species but from different islands uh, of French Polynesia. Also while we're at it, we um, wanted to see if Maldotov was able to distinguish male and female mosquitoes. So please the entomologist here don't jump at my throat. I know that it's something that is extremely easy to do but our general idea is to be able to give anyone, uh, someone that has no entomologist training, any kind of alphabet sample, just give them the SOP, they read it, they apply it, and then the machine tells you everything. Okay? Uh, they don't even have to know how to differentiate the male from a female mosquito. So we did that. So these are not the accurate uh, mosquito species. I just hope that you can see that these are different, but because um, I can't say too much, I just put random mosquitoes. So uh, for this species, this species, you can see that it's quite easy to differentiate male from female and are for the, the, all the other species that were including in the study, it was the same to it works. What was more interesting is that we decided to, as I was telling you, to check if with the same species, we were able to distinguish the different um, origins. So here you have the first species and you can see it's not very confluent. It, it, it still works, but um, these mosquitoes were infected by some bacteria, I can't say. Um, I, I guess it impacted a bit uh, the identification, but you can definitely see that the two strains are different. 
Here, those mosquitoes, that's another species, they were infected and you can see very clearly that these um, two strains were clearly differentiated using Maldita. So um, still on that note of um, population and everything, we decided to try that with bed bugs as well. So first we had to develop a protocol for bed bug identification. Um, so we used the leg, the, the head, the leg, sorry. Again, it was, um, you know, you, you work so well on the legs, you tend to uh, go for it, that immediately try that first and then it doesn't work. So you have to rethink your protocol completely. This is what happened to fleas. We're um, having everything that was working very easily ticks, mosquitoes, and um, triatomides, and like, okay, let's take the legs of the fleas. Uh-uh, didn't work at all. So we had to find out which body part of the flea um, was appropriate for uh, malignant mess. And it was actually everything but the abdomen. So you take the head, the thorax, the legs, all this goes um, to the malignant and this is how we generate flea spectrum. Anyway, for bed bugs, it's the head. So we had several populations of bed bugs. Um, for Cimex emicteris, that is, um, a very common bed bug that you will encounter in tropical uh, settings. Uh, we had a wild strain that we had collected in Senegal and a Kenyan strain, but it actually maintained in the UK. Um, for Simex lectularis, which is also a very common uh, bed bug, one of the most common one that you will find in temperate region, we had a wild strain that we had collected. It was actually um, one of some former students called Linda who was doing this work and she went into an infested apartment it was so infested, the bed bugs were crawling out of the apartment. She didn't have to enter at the end. She just stayed by the door with a scoop and she just took all of it. It was gross. Anyway, but we love it. Um, so we have this train. We also have the reference train London uh, uh, and two fairly um, new strain kept in breeding in the UK, Germany and um, Sweden strains. But we wanted to see if Maldisov was able to tell us uh, what was the origin of each bed bug. So it wasn't perfect, but it was not bad. Uh, we had a bit of issues with the, the Marseille strain, um, but everything else worked really nice. So uh, we were quite happy about that. It was also a uh, long work and it's going to be published soon, I hope. So just much work. So I think I'm done. Yes, I am. Um, so just a few acknowledgements, ex Marseille University that paid for my PhD. This is my former team in Marseille um we have whom have done most of the work so this is fatu here i worked on the mosquitoes from french Polynesia. this is basma i uh, working on lice this is adama working on ticks also rima working on ticks from uh, algeria uh this is hanan that is working uh, is working on our uh, lice in alcohol jack that is working mostly on exonus ricinus uh and now uh, this is the, the technician entomologist on michel Bigonger that are uh, really uh, are spacing the supervisions of the students and maintaining of the insectarium. Um, so I would also like to uh, thank Kemri, which is uh, my current lab, and Marta Maya specifically, who is the person who hired me here. And yep, so this is my email. So you can send me any question related to this talk, or um, if you want to talk about training on Malditop, especially for Arthropods, just send me an email and it will be my pleasure. And that, speaking of question, I'll take any question if I can open the chat. Where is the chat? Good. Any questions? You're so silent today. So remember that you have to put your question in the chat because um, I don't um, allow people to speak because sometimes people forget to uh oh there it goes sometimes people forget to turn off their mic and it's a bit complicated okay so first question um <laughs> okay so after all all the study is Molotov method used regularly outside of research for medical purpose or is it still rare nowadays um it is routinely used because uh, the when you receive clinical samples from patient either it's blood or something else it's very common now in clinical laboratories that people will um, cultivate bacteria from your sample and then submit um, your, the spectra to Molditov to identify all kinds of microorganisms that are found in clinical samples. So it's, it's fairly common now. It's not that common for medical entomology yet, but it's uh, very common for bacteriology. 
that answer that question. If I, you want to talk to ask your question, just raise your hand and I will um, allow you to speak. Otherwise you can just type it. So we're gonna wait a few minutes. All right, I think, oh, no, sorry, who's that? Oh, hi, uh, so are you saying, I'm curious how long the Molotov can identify an infected alpha fudge uh, that has cleared the infection? Um, I, I don't know, I'm not, well, I have part of the answer because for fleas, um, they were still detected exposed up to 14 days and um, yeah, the, until we try, it was still positive. We haven't really done the chronology of this. Uh, and also, um, the thing is, it was only for fleas that we had this uh, exposed category. The others were just infected, non-infected, and um, we didn't really get the chance to explore that question. But um, yeah, it, it's actually interesting. We might, um, do more monitoring of an infection to see um, when uh, the, the insect will clear the infection and how long we can uh, still detect it. But technically, we only detect it when it is um, like the infection is ongoing. Um, okay. Okay, that was just a comment or a question. Thank you, Bradley. Is there any other question? If you're typing, just raise your hand so I know that there is something coming and I don't just shut it down on you. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for Sylvia's question. So for a distinguished sex of mosquito, it seems in one species, the male female clusters were quite distinct while the, for the other species, it seemed less distinct. Is it a technical artifact? Well, we just got this question from the reviewer and we had no explanation. We don't know. Um, I don't know. It's just, it is just different for every species. And this one is particular. We had, we had this kind of results and we can't really explain it. Um, it's just that this, the spectra of the male and the female are very similar. Maybe if we um, change the protocol to adjust it a bit, maybe we would see more distinct different difference but um we really we didn't really feel the need to because it was working for everything else and even if that distinction is still uh, quite small we still managed to uh tell one from the other so there was no real need to uh, push that further but um the reviewer noticed it too i saw another hand raise but they're gone okay so is there any other question? Oh, there you come. Um, I work with the Simulium damnosum complex, oxygen species that are morphologically very similar. Perhaps this is a vector to look at to um, using knowledge of. Um, so uh, it's not published yet, but we have been uh, looking at flies. Uh, it works really nice using the legs. Um, the problem is that it the, the keys to identify them are also difficult to get and and jet bank you know, like molecular biology is really unhelpful so we had uh, nice flies from um where was it the gabon cameroon i can't remember i think it was cameroon and i we struggle a lot to identify them morphologically so we just identified to the genus level and we were counting on molecular biology to help us but it was a huge fail um there is barely any uh, sequence of white fly, like blood sucking flies in gen bank. So it was, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. Um, I'm not even sure. I think this work is really ongoing. It hasn't been submitted or anything because they wanted to include uh, more flies. But if you are interested in this, I will um, just hit me up on Twitter. You have my handle. Um, 
or it's tattooed bug, and I can uh, put you in contact with the team that is still doing that. Um, so is your, the rest of the question was, I'm actually looking at developing molecular bug. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> please do, because there isn't any, and it's just so frustrating. Okay. So um, any other? Okay. Well, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much all for joining.